Stanford University. Um, this goes back to particle physics, so it's a bit off the subject of the class, but there's evidence that the neutrinos have mass mm -hmm. and that they mix. Mm -hmm. In a particle physics class, we didn't address mixing, <coughs> and I, but I wanted to ask if the neutrinos, if they have mass, then must they have all the same mass? No, they don't have all the same mass. <coughs> so then the question would be how on Earth can you mix and, and conserve energy? Well, OK. Um, what it really means is that the, the mass is energy, right? OK. The eigenstates of energy are linear superpositions of the eigenstates of something else. That something else is called uh, the type of neutrino. So the eigenstates of energy don't mix. The eigenstates of energy do not mix with each other. Uh, and um, it's just that the eigenstates themselves are mixtures of different, uh, different states. There are many, many examples like this in quantum mechanics. Um, a simple example is if you have a potential which looks like this. This is the phenomenon of mixing in a particular context. Um, supposing you have a particle that uh, moves in a potential that looks like this. All right, so the particle can be on this side. And let's suppose for the sake of argument that the barrier in between the two um, minima is pretty large, large enough that, uh, that to a good approximation, we might want to say that the particle is either trapped on this side or trapped on this side okay? and can't get through. Now, of course, quantum mechanically, there's a little bit of possibility of leaking through the barrier. It's called tunneling. Uh, but supposing we ignore that to begin with, then we could just take the left-hand side here, treat it as though the right-hand side didn't exist, as though there was an infinite barrier preventing the particle from going through. You could think of this as a brick wall. This is a brick wall, and uh, ordinary particles don't go through brick walls very easily. So it's a good approximation just to pretend this is infinitely high. And in that case, you would ask, what is the ground state what is the ground state wave function and ground state energy of the system? And you might say, well, OK, let's just forget the fact that, you know, that this part is over here. The ground state looks like that. It's some wave function. It has no nodes, no zeros, as smooth as possible, and it has some energy, E. But wait a minute. If this potential is exactly symmetric, then there must be another ground state on this side. Another ground state on that side, which has exactly the same energy. Same energy, same profile, except it's on the other side of the barrier, and in every way is identical. These are two distinct states which apparently have exactly the same energy, but they don't. They don't. And the reason is that these wave functions are not exactly eigenstates of the energy. Now, here's what we know. We know that for a potential like this, the eigenstates of energy are either symmetric or anti-symmetric functions. This is a theorem about quantum mechanics. It's a theorem about differential equations. If the potential is symmetric, then the wave functions which are the energy eigenstates, are either symmetric or anti-symmetric. What does anti-symmetric mean? It means that, um, that when you cross over the dividing barrier between here, it goes from positive to negative. OK, so let's see if we can understand better what's really going on. Um, each one of these wave functions to begin with is neither symmetric nor anti-symmetric. There's one over here, and there's another one over here. And it's neither symmetric. This doesn't look very symmetric. Symmetric means that uh, it is invariant with respect to reflection about the, uh, the origin here. Symmetric would mean that if you reflect it, 
it stays the same. Well, this is certainly not symmetric. If you reflect it, you get a wave function over here. So this is neither symmetric nor anti-symmetric. Neither is the other one. OK. But you can make symmetric and anti-symmetric combinations. For example, if I take a wave function which looks very much almost exactly like that, gets very small in between where the potential energy is very large, can't get into there, or it can but only a tiny little bit, and then continue it symmetrically on the other side. That doesn't look very symmetric, I apologize. But uh, it's supposed to be symmetric. Then this wave function would have a slightly lower energy than either a wave function restricted to this side or to this side. You can lower the energy. Now, how much would lower the energy? A tiny, tiny amount, an exponentially small amount. But the energy of the symmetric wave function would be slightly less than the energy of either one of these. Okay. That's the first state. The ground state, the true ground state, the true energy eigenstate is this combination here. The next excited state looks like this. It looks almost exactly the same. Oh, incidentally, remember that the sign of the wave function is immaterial to anything. If you have a wave function and it's an eigenstate of some operator, if you change the sign of the wave function, it's still uh, an eigenvector of the same quantity. The sign of the wave function doesn't uh, contain any real information. OK, so what is the first excited state? The theorem is that the first excited state always has one node. given. The symmetry of the problem and so forth, the own node, everybody know what a node is? It means a place where the wave function is zero. Okay. If it's anti-symmetric, it surely has a node. It can't be anti-symmetric and not have a node. And if, what does the wave function look like? It looks like almost exactly the same thing on this side. Likewise on this side, except that it's negative. Like that. So over the region where the wave function is appreciable, it looks exactly the same on this side. And on the right-hand side, it looks exactly the same, except that, it, uh, that it's negative. This energy is ever so slightly larger than the energy of just one of these waves if it were constrained to live on one side. So what happens? is originally, before we took into account the, uh, the fact that the barrier is not infinitely high, before we took that into account, we basically had two energy levels. Let's draw energy, energy here. Two energy levels, the one on the left and the one on the right. And they were at exactly the same energy, but not quite, of course. Now we took into account the fact that the wave functions can leak through the barrier a little bit. That's just the fact that it doesn't quite go to zero here. It's almost zero, very close to zero, but not quite. The effect of that is to split these two energies a little bit. It splits the two energies, but gives you wave functions which are not like the original one-sided wave functions. The one-sided wave functions, which would have been what you would have if you really had an infinite barrier in between, get mixed. They get mixed from left-sided and right-sided to left-sided plus right-sided and left-sided minus right-sided. Basically, that's what's going on. You have two states, the left side and the right side. Neither one is exactly an energy eigenstate. And the real energy eigenstates are mixtures of the two of them. Um, the mixtures of the two of them with slightly different energy. What's the consequence of the fact that, there, that the wave functions are these mixtures? It's neither left nor right. 
but 1 over square root of 2 left plus 1 over square root of 2 right, and 1 over square root of 2 left minus 1 over square root of 2 right. Those are the two um, eigenstates of the energy. Okay, so now let's try to find out what would happen if we started, if we put an electron, an electron, a particle, if we put an electron on the right hand, on the left hand side, we start with an electron on the left hand side. What happens? How does it evolve? So we can work this out. Let's uh, say we have two wave functions. One of them is psi left plus psi right. And this is an eigenstate of energy with slightly less energy. Let's say the energy of this is E1. E1 is ever so slightly less than the energy if you couldn't get through the barrier. And then you have, that's the, that's, that's the uh, let's call it E1 minus epsilon. In other words, when the two wave functions mix, the energy is lowered for the symmetric state. And for the anti-symmetric state, there should be a square root of 2 here. And then we have psi left minus psi right over square root of 2. And that has an energy E1 plus epsilon. It gets shifted up a little bit. Okay. Now, each one of these is an eigenstate of the energy. That means that if you were to follow its time dependence, it would, if you were to follow its time dependence, if you were to solve the Schrodinger, that is time dependent Schrodinger equation, what would be the time dependence of this one? E to the i, e1 minus epsilon t, right? Okay. Now, what about this one? This one has e to the i, e1 <coughs> plus epsilon t. Okay, now let's start with psi left. Well, let's call this, let's give this a name, let's call this psi plus, and let's call this psi minus. Psi plus and psi minus. But now I'm interested not in psi plus plus psi minus, I know exactly what happens to either of those, but I'm interested in what happens if I start with pure psi left. Somebody just plopped a, uh, a particle into the left-hand well here. How does it evolve? So that means that at time t equals zero, we start with just psi left. At t equals zero, we start with just psi left. But psi left is equal, at, this is at time t equals zero, so we can set the t is equal to zero. That's equal to psi plus plus psi minus over square root of 2. We get that just by adding these two. The psi rights cancel. And if we're careful about it, we'll find there's a 1 over square root of 2 there. So that's the initial state. Sorry, psi, psi minus. Psi plus plus psi minus over square root of 2 is psi left. So this is the initial state. But how does it evolve? What happens to it with time? With time, each one of these picks up its own phase. So after a time t, the wave function is no longer just psi left. Let's write it down what it is. It's psi plus times e to the i e1 minus epsilon t. That's what happens to psi 1, or psi plus, excuse me, that's what happens to psi plus, and what happens to psi minus? That's plus psi minus e to the minus i e1, I guess it's plus, oh uh, no, it's e to the plus i e1 plus epsilon t. 
Did I get the sign of the exponent right? I did not. It should be minus. It doesn't matter. It doesn't make any difference. Just leave it. It doesn't make any difference. OK. So first of all, we can factor out an overall factor. e to the i e1 t. That factors out from both of them. And then we get psi plus e to the minus i epsilon t plus psi minus e to the plus i epsilon t. over square root of 2. OK, what happens to this with time? With time, these phases are different. Notice that one of them goes as e to the minus i epsilon t. The other goes as e to the plus i epsilon t. What's going to happen? We started out only with psi left. We wrote it in terms of psi plus and psi minus. And now we let it evolve with time. After an appropriate amount of time, the sign of these two will be opposite to each other. How long does that take? How long does it take? These are two different complex numbers. How long, and think about it this way. They're points on the complex plane, on the unit circle. One of them is slowly drifting up on the unit circle, e to the plus i epsilon t, the other one is drifting down. It takes a certain amount of time before the first one is up on the top and the second one is down on the bottom. Shall we figure out how long that takes? Let's figure out how long that takes. All right. We want to know how long does it take for this to become equal to minus that. So let's just write it down e to the minus i epsilon t equals minus e to the plus i epsilon t. Let's uh, just uh, multiply by, uh, what does it say? This says that e to the 2i epsilon t equals minus 1. I just multiply both sides by e to the, e to the plus i epsilon t. I get e to the 2i epsilon t here. And on the left side, I get 1, but there's a minus sign. OK, how long does it take before this thing is equal to minus 1? Well, minus 1 is e to, the, e to the i pi, right? e to the i pi. So the time must be twice epsilon t equals pi. At twice epsilon t equals pi, then we're in this situation where the two phases here have opposite sign. By the time that happens, this wave function has become proportional to the wave function with a minus sign here. All right, there is an e to the 2i epsilon t on the outside, but that's not interesting. What was originally a plus sign evolves into a minus sign because the two phases are not the, because the energies are slightly different, the two phases are getting out of phase, and after a while, they become opposite. Well, when psi plus, when it becomes psi plus minus psi minus, we go back to here. Psi plus minus psi minus is psi right. Just look at it. Take the difference psi plus minus psi right, psi, <laughs> minus psi minus. The psi lefts cancel, and we get just the psi right term. So that means after this amount of time, which if epsilon is small, can be a very long time. If epsilon is small, then this time is very small. But after that amount of time, if you were to look, the particle would be on the other side. It would have materialized on the other side, gone through the barrier, and materialized on the other side. That's what this says. OK, so the phenomenon of mixing goes together with the phenomenon of oscillations. This will go on and on and on after when, um, OK, so 
I suppose. In, a, in another corresponding interval, it'll swing back, swing back and forth and back and forth and oscillate. So it looks like you're getting oscillations between one wave function and the other. That's correct, you are, or between the two sides. It's not violating energy. The energy eigenstates are doing what they're supposed to do. Each one evolves separately. But if you start with a thing which is not an energy eigenstate, it will also do what non-energy eigenstates are supposed to do. It will evolve. And it will evolve back and forth from one to the other. Neutrinos behave like that. Uh, the analog of the left wave function is the neutrino which is made, it's not, it's not made on the left, it's made by the decay of a decay uh, involving an electron, decay of, uh, of a uh, particle that involves an electron and it's called the electron neutrino. Uh, the same precise kind of decay, if it decayed into, instead of an electron, a mu particle, it would make a, uh, a mu neutrino. The real eigenstate of the energy, of the mass, is kind of a, line is a linear combination of the electron and the muon neutrino, which is entirely analogous uh, to the two states, psi plus and psi minus. But when, an electron, when, a, when a neutrino is made, it's made either in a decay involving an electron or in a decay involving a muon. If it's made in a decay involving an electron, it's like plunking the particle into the left well here. If it's made in a decay that involves the muon, it's like plunking the state into the right well. But if you wait a while, it'll just go back and forth between them. Now that's interesting because an electron which is created, sorry, a neutrino, which is of the electron type, can undergo processes, other kinds of processes, not just these decays, scattering processes, in which it produces an electron, will not produce a muon. An electron neutrino will not produce a muon, and a muon neutrino will not produce an electron. So here's the experiment. You start with an electron neutrino. You wait a while, half a period like this again, and it becomes a muon neutrino. And once it's become a muon neutrino, you let it interact with something and see if it produces an electron or a muon. Okay, so if you create this electron, sorry, this muon, ow, this neutrino as an electron neutrino, and then you just let it go a little bit. You, know, you don't let it go very far, very long. Well, if it was produced here, it sort of stays here. So after a little bit, you do your experiment and you discover the electron neutrino only makes electrons, only interacts in such a way as to make electrons. The muon neutrino only interacts in ways such as to make a muon. But if you have a long baseline so that the neutrino can go a long ways, long enough that it undergoes one of these oscillations, an electron neutrino made somewhere, if you go down the line far enough, you'll, dis you'll discover it can make muons. Likewise, the muon neutrino. And in an oscillating way, if you have a very long baseline, you would discover that there are oscillations um, uh, of the neutrino from one type to the other. Question, what determines the size of Oh, well. Uh, all sorts of details, such as the mass of the particle, the height of the potential, the width of the barrier, it's extremely sensitive, exponentially sensitive to, um, to the parameters of the barrier. Is this hmm. Absolutely, both in neutrinos and in um, tunneling uh, things like this. The neutrino masses are the energy levels. Now, they, they start out with very, very small energies to begin with, but then the mixing between them splits the energies a little bit. So they start out with small energies, 
But then even on top of that, there's a little bit of splitting. And uh, so, yeah. So the prevailing wisdom is that neutrinos have mass. Oh, absolutely. It's not wisdom, it's an experimental fact. Yeah. If, if this were, say, an ammonia molecule, that barrier would be represent, it's switching through the plane. But what does that barrier represent when you have a. Well, okay. The, um, I can't uh, What's the ammonia? Is that a te tetrahedron? What? It's a tetrahedron? Yeah, okay. Uh, well, the only reason I say tetrahedron is because a tetrahedron is an obvious one to have a tunneling process. Tetrahedron has um, four atoms, one, two, three. What is ammonia? Do you, what is it? NH4. You're telling me it has five atoms? NH3. So it has three H atoms. I assume that's what an H3 means. I'm not a very good chemist. And then it has a nugi or whatever it's called. Uh, so there's a triangle. And then up above the triangle is the tetrahedral nitrogen. Nitrogen? Yeah. Must be nitrogen. Yeah, right, right. OK. Now, the, the, uh, the, 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 the molecular bonds are such that this, new, that this, I'm going to call it a neutrino. Please help me. <laughs> it's not a neutrino, it's nitrogen. <laughs> this nitrogen likes to sit a certain height above the base of the triangle there, meaning to say its energy is lowest when it's up here. But of course, there's another state which is symmetric where the um, nitrogen is down below here. And the point is you can tunnel from one to the other in exactly the same way. So tunneling from one to the other is basically the nitrogen tunneling through the, through the plane of the uh, hydrogen or something like that. Um, the question was, you can see physically what, it, what the barrier is in ammonia, but what physically is the barrier between an electron and a neutron? Oh, 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 oh. No, no, that's, uh, there's no barrier. There's just a, um, no, 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 it's more than an analogy. Um, the, uh, um, there's coupling in the Hamiltonian, which, for whatever reason, nobody knows why, but there's coupling in the Hamiltonian which takes an electron neutrino to a muon neutrino and vice versa. Uh, in this case, there's no cup. There's a there's a coupling, and the coupling is due to the tunneling process. This is basically the same mathematics. But um, I'll, I'll tell you where else you've seen this. Well, you've seen the same thing, and it's also a good example. Same, the mathematics is the same. Um, if you take a yeah, take a spin. Just a spin. We've done spins, a uh, little, you know, magnetic spin, electron. Without any magnetic field, the two states, let's call them up and down, have the same energy. Up and down have this, uh, the, the same energy. Has energy E, and down has energy E. The energy would be just mc squared for the electron, let's say. All right, now you put a little magnetic field on. Let's say the magnetic field is pointing upward, so a weak magnetic field. What happens to the energy of these two? These are little magnets, if you like. The little magnets, magnets are either up or down, and depending on the direction of the magnetic field, the up magnet will have a slightly different energy than the down magnet. It takes some work to, to turn the, uh, the thing over. So the up electron and the down electron will have slightly different energy. Okay. Um, the up electron and the down electron, oh, no, 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 let's do something else. Let's put, let's, a little different. Let's actually make the, um, the magnetic field along the x-axis. 
let's put the, um, the magnetic field along the x-axis. Then what are the eigenstates of energy for the system? Are they up and down? They're what we called left and right. Remember when we studied spins? They're what we called the electron pointing along the x-axis or the anti-x-axis. But the electron pointing along the x-axis is just a linear combination of the electron being up or down. Same exact kind of combination. Let's call it left. I love this. I like the red. Is this, is this visible? Yeah, yeah. OK. Left is equal to 1 over square root of 2 up plus down. Likewise, right is of the same sort of thing, the other equation there. Now, when I put a little bit of magnetic field on, the result is energy eigenstates which are left and right, but with slightly different energy. Why is the energy slightly different? Well, because depending on which way the electron is oriented, it's either oriented along the magnetic field or opposite to the magnetic field. So we have the same situation where um, there's a slight splitting of the energy levels. What's the result if we were to start the electron up? Let's suppose we start the electron up. Somebody gave us an up electron and said, here, do with it what you want but it's in this very weak magnetic field. What happens to it? Do you remember? It processes. It processes. So after a certain half period, it becomes a down. After another half period, it becomes an up. Same exact phenomena. The energy eigenstates are mixtures of up and down, and because of that, there are up-down oscillations. If there was some reason why an electron liked to be made in a certain experiment, pointing along the up direction, then if you waited a little while, it would be along the down direction. So it's the same phenomena, but it doesn't require any tunneling. It's just a term in the Hamiltonian which mixes the up and down, in this case, the magnetic field. What happened to the tau? Oh, it also gets mixed in there. It also gets mixed in, yeah. So it's the analog of having three states which all get mixed with each other. It's a little more complicated because spin comes into it, but this is the basic phenomenon. And, uh, you know, if you, um, you, you're probably quite capable of understanding it now. It, uh, you, you know enough to, to read a paper or two from, um, on it. Quick question. So in this case, when you mentioned that it, it processes, if we look at it a tiny time after we put the magnetic field, we still find it in the up position. Or with a tiny probability of being in the down. Will it ever be? towards us? No, uh, yeah, it will, yeah, yeah, it will. It'll process around here. So Going from up to down. Uh, so it will not have just up or down. It could be in and out. And it could be in and out. It will never, if you start it up, it will not get along the x-axis. It will stay perpendicular to the x-axis. So it's a continuous on this theta Yeah, it's quite continuous. These phases just evolve continuously. But of course, if you look at it, depending on what you're measuring, let's say you're measuring up or down, you'll either find up or down. You won't find anything in between. But the interesting thing is if you make the electron in an up way and you wait exactly a half in a period like this, you'll find it definitely down. So if there's something that a down electron can do that an up electron can't do, and let's say something that an up electron can do and a down electron can't do, you can do an experiment uh, in which you create the up electron by doing one kind of interaction, and then at a later time, ask whether it's behaving like the down electron. Uh, the, and of course, this is easy to do, much harder to do for neutrinos. Well, it, uh, is that why yeah. you specified a weak, weak field? No, no, no. It's got nothing to do with the weakness of the field. The only reason I say a weak field is because I don't want it to process very rapidly. If I want it to be anything like the neutrino situation where the oscillations are very slow, I will want to make a weak field. 
the, uh, the magnitude of the field only, de only determines the period of the oscillation. Uh, the analog of the field itself is the strength of the mixing between the different kinds of neutrinos. And that's, a, that's simply, and as far as we know now, it's just a parameter. It's a parameter in our theory, and we don't know with any confidence where it came from. It's a very small parameter. Uh, the electron masses are tiny to begin with, and the splittings between them are obviously no bigger than the, than the masses of the bigger the, ma the, the mass of the neutrino itself. And so they're tiny numbers, and what their origin is is uncertain. What is true is that in the standard model of elementary particle physics, there is no room for that parameter. That parameter is mathematically um, forbidden in the absolutely standard theory of particle physics, meaning the, the standard model. So where it comes from is some violation of the standard model, but it's very small, so it could be a very remote phenomena, remote in energy, remote in uh, distance scales, and so forth, and it probably is. Okay. Um, quick, quick question. Yeah. Is, is the only reason that people think the neutrino has mass is because it just it does change? The oscillation. The oscillation. Is that the only reason? Mm -hmm. Other than theoretical, uh, you yeah. know. Right. Because of the relativity, calculation couldn't change if it was. That's right. That's right. That's right. If it was truly massless, it couldn't change. Time dilation is right. Yeah. You, you could do experiments where you detect whether it's in or out of the <coughs> as well as up or down. You can do any experiment you want. Yeah. But um, the, if, yeah, you, uh, right. The polarization of the electron, in other words, the direction of the spin, doesn't tell you what value you would measure except that if it's known to be up and you measure upness or downness, you get up. It does not tell you if you measure the x component whether you get plus or minus, and it doesn't tell you whether you, if you multiply or you measure the y component. So the idea is to put it in a known configuration where if you measured the upness downness, you would get up and then wait a half period until it's pointing down and then measure it again and you will definitely get down. That's the experiment. And after a quarter period, you'll definitely get towards you. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> if you waited a half period to do the experiment with the neutrino, you would get 50% probability of it acting like a mu neutrino and 50% like an electron, correct? That would be a quarter period. Quarter period. No. Um, it's, I don't, I, the answer is no, but for reasons that are somewhat incidental, it is a little more complicated. The complications of spin get into it. And the oscillations are not exactly symmetrical about the two. But that's a, that's a refinement. The basic physics is this. So, um, yeah. Since the neutrino masses vary, and say we were looking at a neutrino coming from the sun to us, to preserve or conserve the momentum, is the velocity changing as it oscillates? Yeah, the velocity, um, yeah. Let's see, the velocity must change, yeah, yeah, yeah. The momentum stays the same, right? And if the mass is undergoing oscillations, uh, right. Incidentally, this is believed to be the reason why there was a deficit of uh, solar neutrinos for many years there was a deficit of solar neutrinos where not enough solar neutrinos were seen on Earth to account for the, um, for the expected number of uh, neutrino interactions taking place in the sun. And of course, the reason was that by the time the neutrinos get here, half of them are unavailable to interact with electrons, or half of them or something. They're, they've become muons or whatever, muon neutrinos or some other species. All right, well, since we're talking about um, these kinds of things, 
Uh, I did read in the article that somebody sent uh, through the email that the electron is a sphere, and I was a little bit surprised to read that. I didn't. I didn't think the electron is a sphere, and I still don't think the electron is a sphere, even after reading the venerable um, Scientific American. <laughs> so I thought I might, uh, since, has that, have people read that article? Oh, only one person read it? Oh, hmm? yeah, it came in my mail. I assumed it came through the, uh, did, it, did somebody send it? Maybe. Maybe it didn't come from any of you. Maybe it came from... Uh... No, it didn't come from Scientific American. <laughs> okay, so there's an article in the Scientific American, just for fun, just for fun, let's... Uh, let's uh, I, don't, I thought we'd take a little bit of a break, at least for part of the hour tonight, and talk about um, real physical phenomena. Not that uh, quantum field theory is not a real physical phenomenon, but you know, we've been concentrating on the formal mathematics of it. Is the electron a sphere? What would it mean for the electron to be a sphere? What does it mean for anything to be a sphere, a particle or an atom or whatever else? Uh, and what is it that was or wasn't measured that according to the author of the Scientific American little blurb there, indicates that the electron is a sphere. And what does that say about uh, physics? Well, first of all, what was measured is the electric dipole moment of the electron. Okay, now we'll come to what that means in a moment, but I think you all know what an electric dipole moment is, right? If you have a little bit of plus charge and a little bit of minus charge and they're separated by distance d, then the dipole moment is just the charge times the distance between them, and it represents a sort of off-centered charge distribution. The center of the dumbbell, let's think of it as a dumbbell, the center of the dumbbell is at the center of the dumbbell, and an electric dipole would indicate that there was an imbalance on the two ends of the dipole of the electric charge distribution. That's what an electric dipole means. For a thing not to have an electric dipole does not, first of all, does not say it's a sphere. Um, a charge distribution can have many, many different multipole moments, many, many different shape parameters. Okay. What kind of shape corresponds to having a dipole? A situation, exactly what I said, where there's an imbalance of charge on one side relative to the other side relative to, uh, some, uh, to, to some center. What are the kinds of charge distributions are they? Well, you could have a charge distribution uh, shaped like an oblate spheroid or, a, uh, or any, kind of, any kind of ellipsoid. Symmetric ellipsoid, non-symmetric ellipsoid, any kind of ellipsoid of that type would not have a dipole moment. Uh, why not? Because the ellipsoid is symmetric about every axis passing, about every plane th passing through the center. If the charge was uniformly distributed on the ellipsoid, there would be as much on the top as on the bottom, there would be as much on the left as on the right, and there would be no dipole moment. What would you say about it? Would you say it was a sphere? No you would say it has a quadrupole moment. A quadrupole moment is the shape of a squashed sphere, an ellipsoid. It could also not even have a quadrupole moment. It could have an octopole moment. That's a little bit different kind of thing. Uh, an octopole moment would be free of dipole moment. It would be free of quadrupole moment, but it's not a sphere. So in measuring the fact that an object doesn't have an electric dipole moment is not the evidence of any kind that it's a sphere. It's just an evidence that it doesn't have an electric dipole moment, nothing more than that. But when you start to think about it, in quantum mechanics, there's something funny about the notion of spherical symmetry and things like that. Let's suppose we had this dumbbell. 
but it's a quantum mechanical dumbbell. There are quantum mechanical dumbbells. Some of my, uh, some of my um, colleagues are... <laughs> I, I didn't say. <laughs> um, here's a quantum mechanical dumbbell. It's a molecule of some kind, a molecule with a bond that's more or less fixed with two atoms, okay, two atoms on either side. Um, let's take the ground state. Now, that doesn't look like a sphere. It doesn't look anything like a sphere, right? In fact, uh, let's not worry about where its charge is for a moment. Um, yeah, we could put some charge. Let's put some charge over here, plus, and charge over here, minus. Okay, now let's take the ground state of that molecule. There are two particles orbiting each other. How do you describe a state of the molecule? You describe the state of the molecule by its angular momentum. Angular momentum about the center. All of the states of this molecule, well, of course, there are also vibrations, but let's ignore the, vi you know, radial vibrations, but let's only talk about the rotational states. The rotational states are characterized by angular momentum. In general, if the molecule is a boson, that means it has an even number of fermions in it. If it's a boson, if the molecule has integer spin, then the ground state will have what spin? What angular momentum? Zero. Sure, the lowest energy will be when the angular momentum is zero. But in quantum mechanics, angular momentum is the generator of rotations. What it says for a system to have angular momentum zero is that its wave function is completely symmetric with respect to all rotations. Angular momentum zero states are all rotationally symmetric. So quite independently of what the charge distribution might look like, the quantum mechanical state is rotationally symmetric. Now you could say, well that just means it's a dumbbell all right, but it's just a dumbbell in a superposition of states which is um, symmetrized so that the probability distribution for the electric charge is completely rotationally symmetric. Does that have a dipole moment or doesn't it? You call that having a dipole moment or, do, or doesn't it have a dipole moment? Well, you say, okay, let's take a snapshot of it. Let's not uh, worry about quantum superpositions and all that sort of stuff. Let's take, just take a quick snapshot of it. At the, at the, at the, look, even what I'm saying here would even be true for the kind of dumbbell that you would get in a gym. If you really got it down to the absolute ground state, which you can never do, of course, the energy levels are so closely spaced, but if you got it down to the absolute ground sta state in infinitely empty sta space, that the wave function of that dumbbell would be completely rotationally symmetric. So now comes a question. Do you, uh, are you willing to call that a sphere, a spherical charge distribution? Or is it just a lopsided charge distribution with a probability distribution or a wave function uh, which has symmetrized it? Okay, the answer is ambiguous. The answer is ambiguous depending on the kind of experiment that you do. If you took a sudden quick snapshot of it, you would discover that it has a lopsided charge distribution, right? But you could ask, how fast does the camera have to be in order to detect that it wasn't smeared over the sphere? How fast, what is the time resolution that's necessary? And the answer is, it's not too hard to figure out. Let's suppose you took a quick snapshot of, this is a measurement, a snapshot means a measurement. And basically the snapshot is measuring the angle of the, um, of the molecule or the, or the dumbbell. You take a quick snapshot and you measure the angle. Well, if you measure the angle, a measurement of something leaves the system in an eigenstate of that something. When you measure something, you kick it into an eigenstate of the thing you measured. So it may have started in an eigenstate of angular momentum. You measure it, 
and all of a sudden it's in a state of definite orientation. Is a state of definite orientation, does it have a definite angular momentum? The anal analogous question would be, for a particle which has a definite position, does it have a definite momentum? <coughs> the answer is, of course, no. That's the uncertainty principle. And the same is true with angular momentum and angle. If you measure the thing and you kick it into a state of a definite orientation, you must have um, given a kick to its angular momentum. Same kind of Heisenberg story. If you measure the position, you give it a knock and you uh, influence its momentum. If you measure the orientation of the molecule, you affect its angular momentum. But what if the, st what if the spectrum of energy levels is such that the first angular momentum excitation is just more energy than you have available in your, in your photons that are doing the measuring? What if the energy to the first excited rotational state is gigantic for some reason? Then your apparatus simply cannot resolve the orientation. So it becomes a question, given your apparatus, what is the excitation? How much energy does it take to excite the first angular momentum state? Now for a basketball or a dumbbell, a real dumbbell, the energy separation between the first state and the second state is incredibly small. You can figure it out yourself. There's moment of inertia, there's quantization of angular momentum, you can figure it out. But the energy level is, the, end, the separation of energy levels is incredibly small. So it's not surprising that with an, with an ordinary light, you can measure the orientation of the dumbbell. It doesn't take very much energy to kick the dumbbell into a state of, defi of, um, of a definite orientation. But for a molecule, the energy levels are somewhat spread. Uh, the smaller the molecule, if we go from molecules, for example, to mesons, mesons are also dumbbells. They've got two quarks. They're also dumbbells. The energy that it would take to kick a meson into, uh, into its first excited rotational state is hundreds of millions or, yeah, uh, yeah, hundreds of millions of um, electron volts, maybe a billion electron volts. That's huge by comparison with any uh, optical photon that you would try to do an experiment with. So if this were a meson, you simply could not, with ordinary experiments, resolve the fact that it's lopsided or that it's not a sphere. All you would do is measure over and over again the fact that on the average it's spherical, that on the average the ground state wave function is spherical. And you keep measuring it, measuring it, measuring it, and you're not going to find out it's not a sphere until you probe it with things which have enough energy to be able to kick it into, um, into a state like this. So the question of whether a thing is a sphere or not is a little bit confusing. This, the molecule is composed of two things with a bridge between them like this. doesn't look like a sphere, but on the other hand, the quantum mechanical wave function sphericalizes it. Okay. Ordinary particles, if they, have sp if they are bosons in their ground states, typically have zero angular momentum, look as spherical as it's possible to be if they are bosons. But if they're fermions, then they have half spin. They can't have angular momentum zero. If they don't have angular momentum zero, it means they're not rotationally symmetric. This has nothing to do with how the charge is distributed. It's just a fact that half-spin particles have an axis. They have a spin axis. You can measure their spin along an axis. They're definitely not spherical. They definitely have a spin axis. So quite independently of any measurement that's done about uh, electric dipole moments, the electron is not a sphere. The electron has, or is not spherically symmetric. It has an axis. The axis is the spin axis. 
you have the spin axis, and about that spin axis, you can imagine a little current. There's a little electric current that goes around the spin axis. This is a little model for the magnetic moment of the electron. You can think of it as having a spin axis, carrying charge around, forming a current, and that current makes it a little electromagnet. Okay, so it has a magnetic moment, definitely not spherical. Uh, and that should be the end of the story about whether an electron is a sphere or not. But what did they measure? Okay, so once you know that the electron has an orientation like that, and the orientation can be defined by the direction of its magnetic moment, then you can ask, relative to that direction, relative to that direction, is there a charge imbalance? Is there more charge on the, let's call this the north, and let's call this the south, it's a little magnet. It's also got electric charge. You can ask what the electric charge distribution is if the electron is put into a definite spin state. For example, up. Well, I didn't draw up, I did some other one here. So we could ask, is there a little bit of excess positive charge at the North Pole and negative charge at the South Pole. Of course, the, the overall electron is not neutral, it's uh, negatively charged. But on top of that, is there a displacement of the center of charge relative to the axis, along the axis of the North-South uh, um, orientation of the magnet? So what we're talking about is a correlation correlation between the electric charge displacement and the magnetic direction. That's the thing that would be called the electric dipole moment of the electron. If you orient the magnetic properties of the electron, the, electric, the magnetic dipole, or just the spin along some axis, then is there an electric dipole moment along that axis? And that's a good question. That means something that's measurable. Okay. Any questions about that? Are you, are you interested? I mean, I'll go on a little more about what the experiment, uh, yeah. So wouldn't that violate uh, charge quantization? No. Why charge quantization? I guess I think of it in terms of you either have a, a fixed charge or you don't. There's no uh, freedom to spread the charge about. If the charge were just a little bit displaced toward the North Pole, it would have a dipole moment. That's all it would take. Just displace it a little bit, uh, whether you smear it or not, all it would take is a little displacement. Uh, and uh, So aren't electric dipole moments uh, forbidden by uh, quantum field theory? No. No. If they were, nobody would be looking for them. They are forbidden by certain symmetries. Okay. So let's talk about the symmetries which forbid, which would forbid electric dipole moment. Okay. The first symmetry that would forbid electric dipole moment is reflection symmetry, reflection in a plane. Now, let us suppose for a moment that the world and the laws of physics were really reflection invariant. In other words, every mirror image is a possible solution of the equations of a system. And let's suppose there's only one electron. Well, if the mirror image of an electron has to be another possible solution of the theory, okay, and if there's only one electron, meaning to say one species of electron, then the mirror image must be exactly the same as the original electron itself. There's only one electron and it must be its own mirror image. Okay, so now let's talk about this thing here. Uh, let's think about it. Let's put a mirror over here. Can you see where the mirror is? Okay. We could also, th uh, we could also think about it. Yeah, let's think about the, uh, the blackboard as the mirror. And let's look into the blackboard. Uh, the traditional way of drawing a magnetic field into the blackboard is to put some tail feathers st sticking out. So that's the tail end of the, uh, and that means, that means that the current is going around this way. 
And we're asking, is there an in-out um, uh, imbalance of charge? I guess this is, this is better. This is better. OK, what's the mirror image of this configuration here? The mirror image of this configuration is another electron, which is also a pointer of some type. Now, the first question is, where is its magnetic north pole, the mirror image? We have the mirror image of a magnet. Where is, in the mirror image here, where is the North Pole? Mm -mm. You think it's here, don't you? Nah. Nah. The mirror image is here again. OK, why is that? It's because the real thing that's going on that gives the North Pole, this is an electromagnet, the real physical phenomena that's going on is not oriented along here. It's the current going around in the loop. The current going around in the loop here is the real thing which is creating the magnetic field. The real phenomenon of magnetism is associated with loop-like currents. Now, let's suppose we have a loop-like positive current going around this way. What's the mirror image of it? It's a loop-like current going around in exactly the same way. So the mirror image up here has a loop going around the same way this does. And therefore, the mirror image of a magnet is a magnet pointing in the same direction. Okay. Now let's also suppose that there was some charge imbalance. And let's suppose that the charge imbalance of this electron over here was displaced up toward the head of the arrow, where would the charge displacement of this one be? Now just think mirror image. Don't think about north, south. Think mirror image. I have a thing with a charge displaced toward the mirror. What's the mirror image going to be? The toward the mirror. So the charge displacement is going to be down here. But now we have an electron which is different than this one. Its north-south is correlated in a different way with its electric dipole moment. This one had an electric dipole moment that's along, that's, that's matched in the same direction as the magnetic moment. This one has an electric dipole moment in the opposite direction. If all electrons are the same, in other words, if there's only one kind of electron and if mirror symmetry is a good symmetry, if the world is really symmetric, in other words, if everything which exists, its mirror image can also exist, but there's only one electron and there's only one conclusion, this charge cannot be displaced from the center. It must be at the center so that the mirror images have the same property. That's the only way that, uh, that the electron charge can be distributed if you have mirror image symmetry, parity symmetry, it's called reflection symmetry, all the same thing. In other words, if the world is such that the laws of physics don't distinguish between left hand and right hand. OK, now the laws of physics do distinguish between left hand and right hand. We know, for example, there are left, no, left hand neutrinos. There are only right handed anti neutrinos. Left and right are not the same. They're correlated with, uh, and reflection symmetry is not a good symmetry of physics. So that sounds like it opens up the possibility of an electron dipole moment. It sounds like once you adm admit, that the world is not symmetric with respect to reflection symmetry, then there's no reason why the electron may not have a dipole moment. However, there's another symmetry which works in a very similar way, which is a much more accurate symmetry. Reflection symmetry in particle physics is bad. It's not even approximately right in the weak interactions. It's broken as bad as it could be. There's another symmetry, and it's time reversal. It's simply the same as the statement that if you take a movie of a uh, thing and you run it backward, that that's another solution of the theory. Now, that may or may not be a symmetry. 
It may or may not be, but let's suppose that it is. Let's suppose that reversing the film is a symmetry. First question is, what happens to the, um, now we're not reflecting in a mirror, we're just reflecting in time. So let's put another le electron over here. What happens on the time reversal to the north-south magnetic moment? Switch. Switches. Why? Because if a positive current is going around this way and you run the film backward, the positive current is going the other way. What happens to the position of the electric charge along here if you run it backward? Nothing. Running it backward doesn't move the electric charge. So when you time reverse it, the north pole gets down here, the south pole gets up here, but the electric charge, if it were displaced, would be displaced toward the south pole here and toward the north pole here. And so again, you would find out that if, if time symmetry, time reversal symmetry were a good symmetry, you could not have the electron having a dipole moment. If there was only one electron, it looks exactly the same as its time reversal, then the charge has to be right at the center because the time reversal interchanges north and south. In other words, it just turns this thing over, but, um, but it doesn't move the charge. Yeah. Currents and charges have to be uh, reversed? Have to be what? Are, are reversed by time reversal? No, currents are, not charges. Charges are reversed by C. Doesn't uh, non-relativistic quantum mechanics uh, already not time reversible because the, the operator is anti-unitary? <laughs> yes, but it's time reversible because it's anti-unitary. Um, it's time reversible. Well, couldn't all of this whole discussion be okay. based upon the fact that electrons are, have, have a volume, it's not a point particle? No, no. We're just asking whether, uh, okay. You don't have to, if, if you want to know whether it has an electric dipole moment, what's the experiment you do? You, we now have, okay, we put the electron into a magnetic field. And um, no, we don't put the electron in a magnetic field. We want to know whether the electron has an electric dipole moment. How do we find out if it has a magnetic dipole moment? You put it in a magnetic field, and you see whether the two orientations of the electron have different, uh, different um, energy. You do the same thing with an electric field. You put the electron in an electric field, and you see if the two orientations of the spin of the electron have different energy because of the electric field. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a very easy way to do it, except that that's much too hard uh, experimentally. It's trickier than that. But that's the basic experiment. OK, so <coughs> time reversal would be enough to tell you that the, uh, that the electron can't have a dipole moment. But is time reversal a real symmetry of nature? The answer is no. Again, in particle physics, we know that time reversal is not a good symmetry. There are processes, in the, uh, even in, in the standard model, which violate time reversal symmetry. But, but the, the magnitude of the effects are very, very, very tiny. The magnitudes of the effect we understand where time reversal asymmetry comes from in the standard model. You can then do a calculation in the standard model of the allowable value of the electron dipole moment. And it's far too small to be experimentally detected. So it's never been, it's never been experimentally detected. And if the standard model is right, uh, I don't know if it will ever be detected, but it would be very hard to detect. They didn't detect it. They detected no dipole moment. That's good for the standard model. The only thing is that most people don't believe in the standard model. They think that the standard model has to be corrected 
by additional particles, by supersymmetry, by new interactions, by new corrupting uh, influences, which potentially could break the time reversal symmetry much worse. So the fact that the electron was discovered to not have an electric dipole moment, the fact that the electron does not have a dipole moment is not an indication that it's a sphere. It's an indication it doesn't have an electric dipole moment. And it makes it that much harder to, um, to introduce things that, that change the standard model. The standard model at the moment describes everything we know. This was an experiment to try to detect an effect that the standard model would not have, could not have. Basically, it's unallowed. It's allowed, but it's at such a level, and it's a, at a computable level, which is much too small. So the result is uh, that this experiment um, makes it even harder to believe in this or that um, modification of the standard model. Experiment. Was it a, 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 a material body or a high energy physics experiment? No, no, no. It's a tabletop experiment involving electrons and magnetic fields and. Uh, yeah, <laughs> electrons and magnetic fields. Uh, I, I, I don't know exactly what the experiment is. I mean, ordinarily you take an electron and you put it in a field and you let it process around the field, but um, uh, for many, many uh, processions. No, but it had enough sensitivity to, to compare with the modifications of the standard model that people would like to see. Right, so uh, it's kind of interesting. I, I always love reading uh, the, uh, the commentary that people write in and how confused they can be about what uh, um, yeah, somebody wrote in uh, saying, uh, well, this really proves that the standard model is garbage and we should give it up. Well, exactly the opposite. It's, uh, it's, um, anyway, <laughs> how did I, I don't know how I got on that. So does that result, hmm? does that result um, constrain in an interesting way which modifications are potentially viable? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Uh, you know. I haven't followed that kind of thing in, in great detail. Somebody like Savas Demopoulos could probably tell you, well, that, uh, that cuts the parameter space down by 72.1%. And, and, uh, um, but you know, any experiment which uh, insists on uh, giving results which are consistent with the standard model to high precision make it that much harder to modify it. So, uh, right. Let's go a quick question. Is, it, is time reversal symmetry and uh, conservation of information somewhat related or? No, time reversal symmetry, is, you always have in physics a symmetry called CPT. That's the, that's the combination of time reversal change the charges, change the sign of the charge, and reflect in a mirror. All three of those simultaneously uh, is a symmetry, always, has to be. And that's enough to ensure that, um, that, in fact, you don't even need that to ensure that information is conserved, no. You can, there are systems, very familiar systems, which are not time reversal invariant. Just an electron in a magnetic field. An electron in a magnetic field goes in circular orbits, and those circular orbits go one way or the other, depending on the sign of the magnetic field. So if you stick in a definite magnetic field, the mathematical structure of the theory is not time reversal invariant, but it's a perfectly good quantum mechanical system. So just a particle in a magnetic field, uh, the mathematical structure of the Schrodinger equation is not time reversal invariant. If you knew what the magnetic field was, and somebody showed you a, um, a movie of the electron moving, you could tell instantly whether it was a movie or an anti-movie, meaning to say that it was going backward uh, rather than forward.
But, of course, that's only because you didn't time reverse everything. What did that experiment, the experiment I just described, electron in a magnetic field and it goes in one direction. What did I fail to not uh, time reverse? Magnetic the magnetic field. Yeah, if I was really doing the full-blown um, time reversal symmetry, I would also have to change the sign of a magnetic field. Yeah. Okay, I, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't know how I got on all of that. Uh, it was not my intention to... Uh, I'm just rambling. It's called old age. Let's stop for a few minutes and then we'll get back to second quantization and all that stuff. Mostly I wanted a rest from doing mathematics on the blackboard. <laughs> okay, we were, we were doing second quantization and um, I thought I would tell you a few things about it that, uh, that I haven't mentioned so far in no particular order, but uh, some of the physical consequences of it. The first, first thing is, somebody asked me whether the field operators and so forth, how they're connected with Fourier transforms. So I thought I would tell you to begin with exactly what the connection with Fourier transforms is. Um, it's very simple. If you remember, in ordinary quantum mechanics, you have wave functions, and the squares of the wave functions are um, probabilities to find particles at different places. You can Fourier transform the wave function, and the Fourier transform is the wave function in the momentum basis. So while psi of x This is not the field operator. This is little psi. Little psi is the wave function for a single particle. Psi of x is the wave function, and psi star psi is the probability. Probability of what? Probability to find the particle at position x, p of x, probability of x. Now, supposing I want to work in the momentum basis, the momentum basis tells me what the amplitude for the momentum to have a certain value, and if I square it, it gives me the probability to have a certain momentum. So that's a thing that's called, I think we probably called it psi, um, did we call it psi twiddle? We did. Psi twiddle of p. The twiddle is just to make another symbol Psi twiddle of p, where p is the momentum, that's a thing which when you square it is the probability, but not the probability for the particle to have a certain position, but the probability to have momentum p. This p and this p are different. One is probability, one is momentum. Okay, what's the connection between psi of x and psi twiddle of p? They're Fourier conjugates of each other, or Fourier transforms of each other. So let's write that down. Let's uh, come over here. <coughs> psi twiddle of p, psi twiddle of p, is equal to the integral over x e to the minus i px, that's the Fourier transform. It's a function of p, not x, because x has been integrated over. And the marvelous thing is that you can go back and forth. If you know what psi p is, then you can reconstruct what psi of x is. And so psi of x is equal to the integral dp over square root of 2 pi 
So I twiddle of p. Only difference, e to the plus i px. And that's Fourier's theorem. That's Fourier's theorem relating uh, functions and their Fourier transforms. Now it has a physical significance, and the physical significance is uh, in terms of probabilities or wave functions for momentum and position. Okay, now let's go now to second quantization theory where we have not a wave function for a particle, but a field operator. Creation and annihilation operators I'm not going to prove a lot of stuff tonight. I'm going to tell you facts, but they're facts which are pretty darn reasonable, and you can reconstruct them from what we said. OK, so let's, uh, let's go back to the definition of the field operator. Now it's a field operator, capital Psi, of x. And it was originally a sum over all the energy eigenvectors of a system of creation operators. This one would be, cre uh, let's see, this is the annihilation operator. Let's call it psi minus. A minus of i times psi i of x, where this psi i of x over here is just the ordinary wave function of a particle with state i. OK, we, were, we, we went through that a couple of times. Now, what if we were dealing with the case of a free particle on an infinite axis, or infinite, whatever the dimensionality of space is, a free particle whose energy eigenstates are what? Just a particle moving in empty space. What are the energy eigenstates of a free particle? Well, you can begin by asking what's the Hamiltonian, and the Hamiltonian is p squared over 2m. So the eigenstates of energy are likely to be eigenstates of momentum. If you know the momentum, then you know the energy. What are the eigenstates, or what are the wave functions of the eigenstates of momentum? They're e to the i p x. Okay? So if we were to go to the case of a free particle, the psi i's of x would be e to the i p x. What, this, oh, yeah, yeah. this i is different than this i. This i is the square root of minus 1 over here. This i is an integer. What happened to the integer here? Where's the integer labeling the momentum eigenstates? There is no integer. All there is is the momentum. The momentum states are labeled by momentum. Momentum is not an integer. It's a continuous variable that goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, but it replaces the index telling you which eigenvector of energy you were talking about here. The eigenvectors are e to the i p x. And instead of having a sum over i, you have an integral over p. And you have an annihilation operator for a particle of momentum p. This object here removes a particle of momentum p in the same way that a minus removes a particle in the state i. So if you have a state with lots of particles in it, and there are, among other things, particles of momentum p, if you act with a minus, it removes one particle of momentum p. What if there is no particle of momentum p there? What does it do? It just annihilates the state in the same way that, uh, that annihilation operators uh, or, or lowering operators annihilate states with nothing in them. All right, so that's psi of x. The field operator. And for good measure, it's a matter of definition, we put a square root of 2 pi there. Just to, to make it look like, um, well, like this equation here. So it looks awfully much like a minus of p in the mathematical connection here is playing the same role as psi twiddle of p here. Okay. 
All we've done is replace sums by integrals, i by the momentum of the particle, and we now have the notion of, a, um, of an annihilation operator for a particle of momentum p. Now, do you remember what psi of x did itself? Not what, not what these creation operators here did, but what did psi of x do when it acts on a, uh, when it acts on a, um, on the vacuum, for example? So, uh, sorry. Oh, I want the uh, creation piece. Psi plus. Same thing except a plus here, with e to the minus i px. Mm, my knee is going. OK, so what does, what does um, psi plus do? It creates a particle. It's got a bunch of creation operators in it. And what kind of particle does it create? A particle at position x. A particle at position x. That's what psi plus of, uh, of x is. What do you think that a, minus of p, a plus of p does? It creates a particle with momentum p. Okay. So it's clear that psi plus and psi minus, oh, incidentally, you can um, invert this equation. You can, for example, write that a minus of p is equal to integral dx field operator psi of x times e to the minus i p x, again over square root of pi to pi. In other words, you can do the same manipulation as you do with Fourier's theorem. You can prove it. You can prove one thing follows from the other. And what it says is that there's a mathematical correspondence or similarity between wave functions in position and momentum space and creation and annihilation operators for particles at positions or particles with given momentum. The A minus of P is essentially the Fourier is analogous. I could have called this here A of P. I could have called this A of P, just redefine instead of psi twiddle. And then these formulas would look very similar. They would look identical. But all this is saying is that the relationship between creation and annihilation operators for positions and momentums, creating a particle at a given position, that's done with psi of x. Creating a particle, uh, is this right? Yeah. Let's do the creation part. Plus, I think it's this way. Um, the creation operators for particles of given position and given momentum are Fourier conjugates of each other. So that's one fact about second quantization. And keep in mind, these are not wave functions now. These are operators that operate to create and remove particles. Psi is the field operator for a particular kind of particle. If there are several different kinds of particles in the system, then you have to have several different kinds of field operators. There's a field operator for each kind of particle. OK, so that's one fact. That's one fact. Second fact, and I'm going to quote some facts now without proof, but they're all things that you can prove from the definitions. And they're, they're straightforward. OK, let's come back to the, let's use the, the A plus I's instead of momentum states. Um, here's something that we wrote down for creation and annihilation operators, uh, I. Do you remember what the commutator of A plus with A minus is? Delta ij. What about a minus with a minus for any i and j? Zero. What about a plus with a plus? Zero. These are the only commutators which are um, non-zero. Okay. 
Well, I could ask a different question. I could ask instead, what are the commutators of size of x at different positions? Instead of asking what are the commutation relations between the creation operators and annihilation operators in the basis i and j, I could ask what is the commutator of the creation operator for a particle at point x with the annihilation operator at point y. We, you, that's right. Okay, but how would you how would you prove it? You would prove it by simply sticking in the definition of the size in terms of the creation and annihilation operators, and then using the commutation relations of the creation and annihilation operators. And what you would find is exactly what was just said. It's just delta of x minus y. In other words, they commute when the points are not the same, and they don't commute, and they were a very big non-commutator. Remember, a delta function has the property that it's infinite at the, uh, when x is equal to y. So the commutators of psi, psi plus and psi minus, have this delta function in them. What about psi plus with psi plus? That's just made out of creation operators, and all creation operators commute. Likewise for psi minus. So the only things which don't commute are psi plus with psi minus. Now, we could, we could, we've mentioned several times, I think, that the psi's, because they're complex, because they're not Hermitian or not observables, this is true. But it's not a very interesting point, because the sum of psi plus with psi minus is an observable, and the differences times i are observables. So let's, uh, this is not a particularly interesting fact. Uh, Question? Yeah. I'm just curious. Um, what does that mean when x equals y? It means that it's very large. No, yeah, and for any x, whenever x is equal to y, it's large. No, no, suppose you put in, oh, okay, I see. Yeah, yeah okay. okay. Now, let's, let's ignore the fact for the moment that, uh, that these are not observables. The real and imaginary parts are observables, and what's true is the commutator of the real part with the imaginary part is also a delta function like this point is the delta function, and uh, it's, it's not so interesting that these things are not Hermitian. You can always make them Hermitian by adding uh, real and imaginary parts. Okay, so what does it say? What, what is the consequence of two things not commuting? You know any examples of, uh, two, of operators which don't commute? X and P, right? X and P are the standard examples of operators that don't commute. X and P, the commutator is I h bar. How about um, sigma, you know, the X component of a spin and the Y component of a spin? They don't commute either. The commutator is the Z component of spin. What's the physical significance of not commuting as far as doing measurements is concerned? You can't do simultaneous measurements of the same thing. Or another way of saying it is the measurement of one of them gives a kick to the other one. Trying to measure the precision, trying to measure with precision the position of a particle necessarily gives it a hard kick and uh, destroys the measurement of the momentum or makes the measurement of the momentum very uncertain. Measuring a momentum very precisely spreads the position all over the place. But let's just say that it introduces mutual uncertainty, mutual uncertainty of the kind, the Heisenberg kind, where one measuring one thing interferes with the measurement of another thing. All right, now this is a very interesting fact here. Let's forget for the fact, let's forget for the moment the delta function when x is equal to y. Let's talk about when x does not equal y. When x does not equal y, it says that these things commute. Okay, this is very, very plausible. It says that the measurement of a field over here does not interfere with the measurement of a field over here. If I measure the electric field, this, this could be the electric, electromagnetic field. 
It's a little bit different, and we're going to come to it but if we get time. But it's a field. It's a field. What this says is measuring the field at one place does not interfere with measuring the field at another place. You can measure a field over here and here simultaneously, and there's no mutual uncertainty in them. Okay. No. When you get right on top of each other, then measuring the real and imaginary parts, uh, you can replace this here commutator by the real part and the imaginary part. Do not commute. Measuring the real part and the imaginary part, these two observables, you cannot measure them simultaneously at the same point. Okay. And they interfere with each other. Trying to measure one gives an enormous wallop to the other one. And, but, and that's, of course, interesting. It's telling us something important. But the more important thing right now is that you don't have any interference in measurements if they're at different places. And of course, that's very, very logical. I mean, that makes sense. Particularly, we're not doing relativity theory now. We're not doing relativity theory, but imagine that we were. The same basic principle is true in relativity theory. Supposing it were true that making a measurement over here interfered with and did something over here at the same instant of time to the possibility of making a measurement at a, at a distant point. Supposing this commutator were not zero. In fact, let's suppose the commutator were big for some reason, that, uh, that the commutator of a field over here and here were big. What that would say is trying to measure the field over here gives the field a kick over here. Makes it impossible to measure it because it gives it a kick over here. Well, I think that would violate your sense of, uh, of causality or your sense of locality that Einstein tells us that signals should not propagate faster than the speed of light. Somebody over here trying to measure the field and, get to, and finding that he can't do it because it's not commuting with something over here uh, violates some notion of independence of measurements at different places. In particular, if we take two places and times, which are such that light could not go from one to the other, they're space-like separated from each other, then we would be in a very confusing situation where measuring a thing over here and a thing over here wouldn't commute, would interfere with each other, and that seems to violate the spirit of, uh, of information or perturbations or signals or um, uh, effects do not propagate faster than the speed of light. And that's true. Okay. Isn't that what EPR experiments already show? The what? Um, that the effect of a measurement over here has, has a uh, consequence for a measurement over there. Oh, boy. <laughs> no. What? No. Entang the, 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 the most fundamental thing about entanglement is it does not tell you that making a measurement over here has an influence over here. Well, I didn't say influence, I said cor I meant correlation. Yeah, I know, but we're talking about influence. We're talking about making a measurement over here, giving a sudden kick to something over here. That's exactly what doesn't happen where, because of entanglement. Measuring something over here does not give a thing a kick over here because of entanglement. It can only give a kick over here. And the reason why is because things at one place commute with things at another place. That's exactly the reason why entanglement doesn't uh, send influences faster than the speed of light, because all the degrees of freedom at one point commute with the degrees of freedom of someplace else. And that means they behave independently. Correlation is different than influence. Um, so what this says, this is good, this says that there's no violation of your naive ideas, or maybe they're not so naive, but your straightforward ideas about the independence of measurements at different points of space. Now, of course, um, uh, we're not doing relativity, but nevertheless, it's still a true thing here. We're going to come next time to fermions. Fermions are fields, or fermions are particles, 
which do not satisfy any of this. In fact, they satisfy a different algebra with anti-commutators. We're going to work that out and why it's true. But the one thing it says, and anti-commutators don't have to do with independent of measurements. It's the commutators. Commutators tell you that things are independent and measurements are independent. Fermions, the fields, anti-commute at different points. They don't commute. If they don't commute, that means you can't measure them simultaneously at two different points, no matter how far away. A measurement of a, of a fermion field at one place gives a sudden kick to its complex conjugate arbitrarily far away. That sounds crazy, uh, or fermion fields are not observables. There's no way that you can construct what it's telling you, really, that there's no way that you can construct a device to measure a fermion field. Why? Because that device would have to be spread all over space and be extremely non-local. That's what we're going to take up next time, fermion operators. Fermion operators are the operators which create and annihilate electrons. Boson operators are the operators which create and annihilate photons. So we'll come next time to the fermion version of second quantization. Okay. And uh, do that. Okay, good. I'm, I'm thankful that nobody uh, forced me into doing any mathematics tonight. Well, we did a little bit. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.